Hello and welcome. Hi, I'm Dave. This tutorial is part of a beginner CSS series. I'll be using the Chrome web browser, the Visual Studio Code editor, and the live server extension for Visual Studio Code to view the web page. There are links to these tools, starter code files, and all resources in the description below. Let's learn about styling images with CSS. We'll be looking at foreground images and background images today. Foreground images are the images on the page, and as you might expect, background images are in the background. So let's look at our starter code. We have a basic HTML page here with nothing in the body right now. And then for the style.css file, we're importing a font from Google, and I have changed this from Roboto that I've used in previous lessons to Nanito. I believe that's how that's pronounced and you can see it is used right here. You can use that or you could still use Roboto or really any font you want to. That's just a preference thing. And you don't have to go back to the Google Fonts site to do that. You can just change it in the string here where family equals and puts the font name and then of course match that here. Now if you choose a different font of course make sure it matches up with everything you have chosen that the uh, fonts google.com site recommends. Okay, so then we've just got our basic CSS reset, and on the body we are applying that font family and a minimum height of 100 viewport units. Now we've got a lot to learn about images today, so let's get started inside of the HTML and we'll add some content that we can style. We'll start with a section, and I'm going to apply the class example because I'm just going to give this as an example for now. Then we want a paragraph, and then inside the paragraph, let's go ahead and put an image element. And you can see it automatically gives us a source and an alt attribute. For the source, you can see inside of our image folder, we've got several images, and we're going to use this pat1.png. I'll click on this. You can see in Visual Studio Code, it is just a square with a pattern on it. And then you can see at the bottom, it has 200 width by 200 height. That is the dimension of the image. Now as we learned in the HTML lesson, we'll want to apply that width and height to let the browser reserve that space to prevent content layout shift. But what I'm going to do right now is type the image folder because we need to look inside of that folder for the image, press tab, and then it gives us a list in VS Code of the images we can choose. I'm going to choose this pat1.png and then I'll just say pattern one here as the alt text, which you always want to provide for images. But then let's go ahead and apply the width and set that equal to 200. There shouldn't be pixels or any type of unit on this. We just apply this intrinsic value and you can reference that in MDN as well as it suggests to do that. And this is just once again reserving that space in the browser. It's not really going to use these settings. We can override that with CSS, but in case of a failure of the CSS file to load or anything else, we are telling the browser to reserve this space. So let's go ahead and set that. And then I want to put some text inside of this paragraph as well. And I'll just say, yeah, this is a paragraph. And we'll look at what gets rendered on the page with this. So I've already started the page with live server and you can see it is running down here. I'm going to drag this to the left as we'll split the screen and we can see what we have on the page. Now we have got our image and we have got the paragraph next to it. But we need to apply some styles to what we have put on the page. So I'm going to drag this back over and let's go look at the style.css. Let's start by styling our section element that has the class of example. And we'll put a margin at the top just to push it down just a little of one rem. And then we'll say padding dash left to give it just a little padding from the left and we'll give that 20 pixels. And now let's give a border. I often do this just to see or highlight what I am designing and then remove it later. So a one pixel solid red border, that's fairly common to see what we're working with on the page. Okay, after we've applied that class, let's go ahead and apply something to the image. So we'll choose that class and the image within, and now we'll say width 25%. But that's not where we'll stop because we did apply a height in the HTML and it will not ignore that height. Now I have heard others say do not apply a height because if you just apply a width then the height will respond. That's true if you have not set the width and the height 
inside of the HTML. But as currently recommended, we are doing so. So since we have done that, we need to go ahead and set the height to auto, and then it will respond to the width. So let's just save this. Now once again, no, this width is not 25% of the image size, it's 25% of the container size. So I'm going to drag this back to the left, and now we can look at this, and we see we have got a red line around our section, and then we have our image, and then we have our paragraph. Now there's several things I want to look at here. One, since I've talked about the width of 25%, we have made that image responsive. So I've drugged this over to the full page now, and I'm opening up DevTools so I can resize the window. Now notice how the image shrinks as I resize the window, and it expands as I make the window bigger. That is a responsive image. We have given it a percentage width, and we have the height responding by setting to auto. Again, we have applied the height because we applied the height in the HTML as recommended by MDN. And the way to make it responsive then is apply the height of auto in your CSS as it will respond to the percentage of the width that you set. Okay, I'm closing DevTools now and dragging this back over to half the screen. And what we really want to look at now is this paragraph. Notice the Y and also the P here and the G and another P. These are the letters that have something that sticks down below the line we're typically writing on. Now notice what happens over here with the image. It's the same way. Also notice it's on the same line as it was even before we highlighted the container. That's because images or image elements are not block level elements. They're actually in line. And this was the original specification with HTML, but we often don't want this behavior. So even if I removed this paragraph right here, you would still see this space. We didn't apply padding or margin or anything to create this space here. But it's often wondered, how do we remove the space below an image? Well, that's because an image is actually an inline element, and it allows that space because it was originally envisioned as being used with uh, paragraphs or with text overall. So you get this space you don't want here, even though you don't provide a margin or padding. I'm going to show you how to remove that first. So let's go back to our CSS. And this is part of a reset that you can just typically do. Now it doesn't go inside of the asterisk because that selects all elements. So just at the top, you want to have image and then display block. And we can save. And now let's go back and we can look. And with a block element, of course, it wraps down to the next line because you know a block element takes up the full width of the page. So let's go ahead and go back to our HTML. And I guess I need this full page once again so we can see what we're doing. But I want to remove this text right here. And even though it's inside the paragraph, and we could remove the paragraph if we want to, I guess I'll go ahead and do that too. But just inside this section, I'll save and bring this back over. You can see there is now no space underneath. And I'll switch back to the style here. If we did not have this, and I'll comment this out with Shift, Alt, and the letter A, and save, even without the paragraph, we have this space underneath the image. So you want to set those to block because they're originally in line. And then you remove that space that you weren't expecting. Now let's move on to our next example. So I'm going to pull Visual Studio Code back over to full screen, go to the HTML, and I'm going to comment out what we put in for our first section. I'll leave it in there for you so if you download the code though, you can see that example. So now the next thing we want to do is create another section. I'm going to give this a class. And I'll set this class, well, not class, I typed class, I should have typed hero, there we go. So I'll give it a class of hero. And now inside this, instead of just an image, I'm going to put a figure element, because that's what we usually put images in. And I'll give this a class of profile-pick-figure, so we know exactly what we're talking about there. Now inside the figure, I'm going to put the image element, 
and then we don't really need to apply a class there. We'll just use that profile pic figure to reference the image inside of it, and you'll see how I do that. Now we once again want to look inside of our image folder for the source, and then pick one of our images. And you can see I've got a profile-800 by 800. And if we look at that image in Visual Studio Code, you can see the image here, and you can see the dimensions below. That's 800 by 800. I'll go ahead and close that out. Let's give it an alt and I'll just say profile picture. And then we need to apply the width and height again. We could also apply a title, if you remember that attribute from HTML. And there we'll just say my profile picture. And that shows up when we mouse over the image. Okay, after that, let's apply the width and that would be 800. And then let's apply the height, and that's also going to be 800. I'm going to press Alt-Z to wrap the code. That way we see it without scrolling over to the right like it was. Now, if you remember the figure element, we also need a fig caption element. So let's add that. And inside the fig caption, I'm just going to say Jane Doe. So the name of the page that this uh, image belongs to, or the name of the person in the image, if you will. So we want to add that. It helps accessibility. And I'll show you how to hide it if we don't want it on the screen. So let's save that much. And now we can look at our page and see what we've got so far. It's pretty big. It's filling up the whole page, isn't it? So we can definitely change that with CSS. I'm going to hide the file tree by pressing Control B, and we can make our changes here. I'll make them below the body, but above the previous example. Let's start with the profile-pick-figure class. And there we'll just say a width of 35%. And that would be the width of the page it's referring to because that is currently the container. Actually, it's that hero that we created, so that section, and it should be the width of the page. So after that, let's go ahead and apply the next to the profile, pick, figure, and then the image within. And here, let's give the image a width of 100% because it's in a container, and the height, once again, auto. And this does make it responsive. We've got a percentage for the width and the height set to auto. Remember, we set the width and height once again in the HTML to avoid that content layout shift. Okay, now we've got min width. Let's set that to 100 pixels. We just don't want the image to get any smaller than that when it does shrink. And then let's put a border around it. So let's say border five pixels double gray. So it's not just one solid line, it should be two. And now let's go ahead and save first. And you can see what we've got. Here is our fig caption. We're only taking up 35% of the width of the full page right now because that section container element is 100%. And so the figure is 35 and then the image fills out 100% of that figure that is 35% of the page. Then we've got this double line around the image and you can see the fig caption underneath. One more thing I want to do to our image though is make it round. And since we have a square image, this wouldn't work if we had a rectangle, but with a square, we can do this. And let's say border radius, say 50%. And when we save, we now have our profile image in a circle. Let's go back to the HTML and add just a little bit more inside of our hero section that we have right here. So after the figure, I want to add an H1 to the page. I'm going to give this a class of H1 as well. Inside the H1, I'm going to go ahead and give a span element and give a class of no wrap because I won't want what's inside the span to wrap. If you remember, a span element is an inline element. I'm going to say hello, and then I'm going to paste in a little wave emoji here. So I'll just paste this over. And you can get those wave emojis from different places. I use emojipedia.com, I believe, to get that one. After that, I'm going to provide another span element, and once again, give the no wrap class. And here, I'm just going to say, I'm Jane. 
as that's who's in our picture. And now we can instantly see that on the page as well. So we've got our H1, we've got a couple of no wrap classes here, and we've got the H1 class on the H1 element. Let's go back to the CSS now. Okay, let's start below the body, but above our profile pick figure class. And if you remember, we have a hero class. And that is the container, that is that section element. Let's put a border on the bottom only so we can see it. We'll say two pixels solid. We'll give that a color of black. When we save, we can see that change instantly. Let's add a few more styles to our hero. Let's give some padding here of 20 pixels to push everything a little bit away from the edges. There we go. And now let's give this a display of flex. And by default, flex is a row. So we'll already have our content in a row then instead of stacked on top of each other. Now let's say justify dash content and let's say flex start here. And then after we put that at the start, let's align the items to center. And after we align the items to center, let's apply a gap between the items of about 30 pixels and save. And that's what we've got now. We've got our image over here on the left, and we've got the hello, I'm Jane on the right. Now let's go below the hero section and add our H1 class. And inside the H1 class, let's make this font a lot larger. Let's say font size 500%. And we'll save and see how big that gets. Nice and big, that works, okay. What I'd like to do though is make the page full screen once again and look at DevTools so we can resize the page and see some things. Right now, even though we put those classes on, we haven't defined those yet, so we're getting the text to wrap in some strange ways that aren't always the way we want here. But notice our image is shrinking nicely, but it stops at the 100 pixel uh, minimum width that we left it. And we still have that fig caption on there that we'll want to remove as well. So just checking out the resizability of everything at this point. Let's close DevTools, move Chrome back over to the right, and let's define those utility classes. So if we come up to the top, we can put some notes in here, and we can say, begin reset with our comments, and then after our image, we can say, end reset, and there we go. And now let's go ahead and put utility classes, just organizing this CSS a little bit, and then we'll say end utility classes. Okay, so we can define these utility classes right in here. The first one will be no wrap. Now these are things we've covered in previous lessons, but it's a good review, so we'll set white space to no wrap. Now when we save, notice what instantly happened on the page. I'm was over here, but we've got it to where I'm Jane should not split. That should not wrap. The same with the hello and the wave. So now they're on the lines that they should be on. And we don't want to see the word I'm and the word Jane break. And we don't want to see the hello and the wave break. And that's why we applied those classes of no wrap the way we did. Now let's go ahead and apply an off screen class also. So this off screen class will still allow the fig caption to be read for accessibility but it will hide it from the visible page. So we'll say position, set this to absolute, and then let's just send it left minus 10,000 pixels and save. And it looks like it's still on the page. Maybe we don't have that on our fig caption yet. And we don't, I forgot to put it on there. So let's give it a class equal to off screen and save, and now our fig caption is gone as I expected it to be. We've got the basics of a hero section here, a header for our page, but it's pretty plain right now. So let's start working with background images. So now that we have put our utility classes here, let's scroll back down below the body and back to the hero section. Now after this gap for our flex box display, I'll put an extra line so we can see these new properties we're going to work with. The first one is a property you have seen before, and that is background-color. We want to put a fallback, and that is if the background image doesn't load, we at least want to have a color behind it. So let's put RGB, and I'm going to go with a color I discovered that I think I like. 
and just put these three values in there. You can see it's kind of a peach or gold. I'll save this. And there you can see the background color that we now have for the hero section. But that's a fallback. So let's go ahead and put in a background image. That is background dash image. Now you would think we might specify image here, but actually we need URL. And inside of the parentheses then we put quotes and now we need to go inside of the image folder again. But remember we were doing that in HTML simply by typing image, but we're not in that folder now. We're in the CSS folder. So we need to go up out of the folder and that's two dots to go up, then a slash. And now you can see Visual Studio Code says our image folder is there. And now let's pick this pat one that we looked at before. It has a pattern on it. And I guess I need to put a semicolon there where that ends. That was right at the end of the line. And now let's save. And of course our text is black, so that doesn't look too good there. But otherwise, you can see this pattern behind everything. And it's a repeating pattern. And we'll talk about that too. Let's go ahead and quickly add a color to our H1 so we can see our text again. So now we've got, hello, I'm Jane in white. But what is happening by default is our 200 by 200 image is repeating both on the X axis and the Y axis in both directions. And it's filling this out and the pattern looks pretty good. You can't see where it starts or ends really. So what we can do to control that is the background dash repeat property. And we can just say no repeat. And now let's look at what happens. Now we just have our 200 by 200 image up here in the top left by default. Likewise, we've already seen what happens with the default repeat value and it repeats everywhere, but we can just say repeat Y for the Y axis and it just stays all on the up and down, essentially the Y axis or repeat X and it's all on the X axis, which would be horizontal or across. Let's just leave it to repeat for now, even though that's the default, I'll just leave that property in there and let's change out this image. Let's look at another pattern that I have saved in there, which is pat two. We can save that. Now our white font doesn't look as good on top of it. And it's always important. We want to emphasize this. The font is the most important thing. So you have to work with that to be visible because if it's not, the background image is essentially that. It's just background. It's not really what's important. You can see the lines if you look closely to see how this image repeats just a little bit more often. So if we set this to no repeat, I believe it's once again 200 by 200 or something like that. You can see the image by itself there. And if I save, you can see it repeat across. Now, if you have a transparent image and I set up a transparency of this image as well, and you save, you can see now this kind of looks cool because we have some of that color that's underneath coming through the image. And I'm not going to show how to create transparencies in this tutorial. That would be more like a Photoshop or other image editing tutorial. However, if you do have access to images that are somewhat transparent like this, it is a cool effect to do that. And of course, I would probably switch this text back to a black font or something that would show up better on top of it at that point. Now let's also look at some more images like you would use. And once again, I want to emphasize how important it would be to make your text visible no matter what image you're using. And we're just seeing the clouds right now, but this is a much larger image. If I go over to the file tree and click on this scenic image, drag Visual Studio Code back over where you can see it all, we've got a waterfall, lots of things in this image that we might want to see. So we can change that. Let me bring this back over, hide the file tree so we have some room. Underneath our background repeat, let's put in background dash size and set this to cover. When we save, now we see much more of that image but it still might be a little concerning how readable this text is. So you might want to work with that, of course, to make it stand out some more. But that does look good. Now let's drag this over as well. And if we open this up, you can see it's definitely bigger here and looks different. Let's open up DevTools. And once I have DevTools open, you can see how the image resizes with that cover setting. And there are other settings for background size as well. You could put in an absolute or percentage 
or other things you might want to. But cover is a very nice one to use. I'll go ahead and close this and move this back. Another word that you might use in there besides cover is contain. So let's at least see what it does. It's not what we want to use. But since it's repeating, you can see that we have two of the image now because it does repeat. If we set this to no repeat and save, you can see cover or I'm sorry, contain, fits the full image in here and contains it, but it doesn't make it cover the space that we want it to. So let's put this back to cover for our use. And we can leave the no repeat there as well because that's what we want. But let's say we showed this to Jane and she's not quite liking it. Of course, the text isn't popping out and she wants to be more about discovering things, not just about an image of some cool scenery. So we're going to change this scenic image and let's change it to an image of a map. And you can see it's a rather large image, which is something else I didn't discuss. Now, this would be a different tutorial to talk about image optimization. A lot of times you want to shrink images down, and this is a rather large image. But that said, you also have to be careful because some devices have different amounts of pixels. And if you use too small of an image, then it will look blurry on the devices that possibly have more pixels. So one rule of thumb I have heard is always use an image that's twice as big as what you plan on displaying, and that would help it upsize to that extra pixel setting essentially and still look good without looking blurry because otherwise you're essentially stretching an image to increase the size of it and that does make images look blurry. So again, optimization would be something to consider. But Jane likes this image a bit better. It gives maps and she's talking about exploring and taking pictures. And so here we've got a background image with maps on it, but still the font isn't popping out quite as much as we want. So there's some things we can do there. Let's go back to the CSS and I need to scroll back over here a little bit. We can add some more to our H1. So this color, the white looks good. I mean, it does pop out a little bit, but let's do something that's not quite white. Let's give uh, Alice Blue a try, which is kind of a different white. You can see it's not quite the same white, but it does look white. It doesn't really look blue to me at least. And after that, we can apply a text shadow to make it pop off the page just a bit. This is applied to the x-axis, so we'll say two pixels, y-axis two pixels, and then there is a blur value, and that makes the shadow not as crisp, but a little blurry. So I'll put that at five pixels, and then we say what color we want the shadow, and we'll just make it black. When we save, you can see that text pops off the page just a little more. So that's something you can do to help your text stand out as well. Don't abuse it though. You, you can do way too much with that. But of course, it's set to preference. And then after that, we could put a background color. So let's talk about that. If we put in background color and we just set it to black, that's not gonna look that great, but let's go ahead and do it for the moment. And now, if you remember from our color lesson, we can click on this square, open this up. I'm going to go over to HSL, and then I'll drag the transparency down here. And I'm thinking maybe let's go to 40% and see what we get. If we leave that and now we save, well, now we can see the image because it's a transparent color and that helps a little bit. Now we could add, and again, this is to preference, complete preference here. We could go ahead and add some padding. So let's do that and try it out. We'll say padding and let's go 0.25 rem. And then after that, we can also add a border radius to that background. And let's just go with 10 pixels to round the corners. And so now you see this kind of contained here, but I don't know if I like that or not, but there is another trick we can do that kind of applies the same thing, but it does it more broadly so you don't really see this box around there. So I'm going to comment these out, but once again, leave them in the code for you because that is to preference. Now let's jump back to our HTML. And what I'm going to do is put a container around our hero section. And here I'm going to use a div and I'll just say class of container. I'll take that closing div, control X to cut it out, come down to the bottom of the section, 
paste it in with control V and save. And now we have a container around our code. I guess I could highlight this and tab it over to make it a little more uniform. There we go. And now that we have the container, we can style that container. So we'll go back to our CSS. And again, this is a workaround only if you're trying to make the text a little more legible, you want a little more control and to get that separation between the background and the text. So this is nothing that is required. It's just something that you might want to know how to do. And what we're going to do is essentially create a filter or a mask by having this extra layer. So it's just a little bit more of an advanced concept, but it's not too difficult to do. I'm going to take everything we have here for the background of the hero section, and I'm going to put it in the container. And now that we have that, we can save and we shouldn't really see any difference because the container is going to be the parent of the hero. So we would still see all of this behind it. And now instead of in the H1 where we had this background color here, let me go ahead and just copy this. And we might wanna use a different color, but we'll try out the black at first. We can put in that background color that we were putting just on the H1, but now this will apply to the full hero. So let's go ahead and save this and see what it looks like. And you can see everything got darker. We've essentially put a filter that we can lighten or darken as we choose. So I want to put a different color here and try this out. So let's make this 100% right here and save again that lightened it up. And now you see more of a light filter on it as well. So you can experiment with this. And of course you could go into the colors and choose anything you want to as well here in Visual Studio Code. I'm going to press Alt Z just so we can see that wrap down here. So if we didn't want that, maybe we want a little more transparency. Consider that 35%. And maybe you liked the darker color instead of the light color. So if we went back and made that a zero. That's essentially working with black there. So now you've got a darker color, but it's a little more see-through. Maybe make it 25. I think I liked the lighter color myself. So I'll go back to 35 and then I'll put the 100% here in the third value. And yeah, that kind of pops off, but it still has that filter and you can see the maps. I like how that looks just personally, but you could change any way you want to. Maybe you'd want to make the double circle around Jane here in black instead of gray now that we'd have a darker color, and that's something you could do as well. But we've made a nice hero section overall. Now let's talk about one other property that I didn't bring up for the background yet, and this would be background position. I'm going to put it after the repeat, and it's background-position, there we go. And now it has an X and a Y as well. So you might see this adjust and it's how it moves the image. So if we put center, center, you can see, yeah, the map moved a little bit. So even though we're working with one image that's covering the whole span, you might see it move. So you could say top right, just see how the map moves around for you a little bit and top left and not really noticing a change there. What if we said bottom right? and move it, yeah, the map moved again because now we're seeing the bottom of the image. That's the biggest change right there. Now, if we switch it to top, we'll see the top of the image instead. I like that a little bit better because it's a little darker up there towards the top, I believe. And you could just provide one value, I think, as well. And if we did center, yep, it's somewhere right in the middle now. We're not seeing the top or the bottom. But if we went back to playing around with a smaller 200 by 200 uh, pixel image, you would actually see that one image move around the page as well. So this is just something worth checking out to see what part of the image you want to display for the background. So I'm just going to leave this as top now because that makes it a little darker and looks okay to me. It's time to move on to another example. I'm once again going to leave this CSS in the code. I'll just come to the HTML. I'm going to bring this back to full page and I will comment out what we currently have here as well and leave it in the code for you. Again, pressing Shift, Alt, and the letter A to make that comment after I selected all of that. And so now we're ready to add something new to the page. So we'll come back over here so we can see the page again, and it should be blank, and it is. 
let's add something to the body itself. Let's start with our fallback background color. So we'll say background color. Oh, that just said background, which is shorthand. We'll get it to in a minute. But we've got our background color. And just so we know it's changed, let's go to this Alice blue again, which isn't quite the same as the white default. And now you can see it's a different shade here. And after that, let's provide an image. So we'll say background dash image. And here we'll say URL once again. And inside the URL, we need quotes. And remember, we're in the CSS. So we go up out of the CSS folder and then into the image folder. And now I'm going to go ahead and, well, you know what? Instead of this image at first, let's do a linear gradient first. And then we'll see how we can put an image on top of that. So let's go with linear gradient. And let's talk about this. This is how we can switch from one color to another. So I'll supply the first color steel blue. It's a color that I like. And the second color, let's go with white. And when I save, we'll see the default behavior. It's starting at steel blue at the top and going to white at the bottom of the page. And we could put other colors in here as well. So if we wanted purple in the middle, we can provide purple as well. And now when we look, it goes from steel blue to purple to white. So you can use pretty much as many colors as you want to, and you could have a, a veritable rainbow, I should say, going from top to bottom, or as we'll find out here, any direction you want. So I'm going to say to left and save, and you can see it's white on the left and it's blue on the right. So it starts at the right and it goes to left. We could do the opposite of that, to right, and there you got blue on the left to white on the right, you could go to bottom, which is essentially the default, or you could go to top as well. So nice changes there. I'm going to go to, well, let's go to left and leave it like that. So now we have this background and imagine we were typing uh, paragraphs over here on the left and we stop somewhere and it gets darker over here on the right and that would work for us. Now let's look at how we can apply a second background image and you can apply more than two if you want to but I'm just going to do an example with two. So now I'll say URL, provide the parentheses here, a comma after that so we clearly have our two images defined and I want to go ahead and space this over if it will and I may need to go ahead and drag this to the full page and now we've definitely got some space there so let me remove those spaces I just wasn't seen them before. Bring this down to another line and I like to have the images lined up like this when I set it so or a gradient and an image if you will. So now I'll put in the quotes we need to go up out of the CSS folder into the image folder and now I'm going to pick bubbles. So we have a bubbles background image and a linear gradient both. Let's save and drag this back over to see what we've got. Well, now we have bubbles all over the page and that may not be what we want as well. This isn't responding like I want it to when I drag this back over. So I'm going to put these back to back. So we just, it's one long line essentially is what this is for the background image. We supply the first one and then a comma and then the second one and a gradient qualifies as a background image as well. So now when we define our background repeat, we can put in a value for both of these images. So the first one I want to repeat on the Y axis. That's our bubbles. They're gonna go from top to bottom, but not left to right. Then we put a comma and the second one, the gradient, I'll just put no repeat. And when we save, now we only have bubbles on the left, but we can change this as well. So let's go ahead and put in a background uh, position. So we'll say background dash position and now we'll say we want them on the right and let's use the center so now when we save there we go our bubbles are on the right and they show up much better this is a transparent image that I have over here so if we just look at the image and I pull this over you can see it here in Visual Studio Code it's originally 300 by 300 it has a transparent background with white bubbles Okay, we'll drag this back over and that looks good with this steel blue background that we're seeing on the right with everything we've set up. 
can't see the code too well, I'm going to press Control B to hide that. So our background position has moved the bubbles much like we want them to be. But the bubbles still look a little too big. So let's say background dash size. And now this first one will be for the bubbles. So this stacks in this order. The bubbles go on top of the gradient, so they come first in the background image and the gradient comes second. Likewise with repeat Y applies to the bubbles, no repeat to the gradient. Background size, 20% for the bubbles and then we'll put auto for the gradient. When we save, we have smaller bubbles now over on the far right. Now we've wrapped up our example of linear gradients, which are fun to play around with, and also layering background images. So we've got one more example to look at today, and once again, I'm going to comment out previous code we were using. As you can see, we don't have any other in the HTML, but I'll add a little here and then I'll comment out some of what we have in the CSS just so we don't have that bubbly background for this new example. So I'm going to provide another section and I'll give this a class. Well, this doesn't need a class, but just inside the section, let's go with a paragraph that has a class of clip. And now inside this paragraph, I'm just going to type Jane's name and save. And we can see her name up here in the top right for now. Let's go back to this style. Once again, I'll a comment out this background that we currently see here. I'll leave the background color, but everything else, but I'll leave it in the code for you. Again, shift alt and the letter A to comment that out. And if I save, that should all be gone. We still have Jane's name. So now I'll scroll down here all the way to the bottom below our first example, and I'll provide this clip class. And there's several things we want to do here. We want to give this a very heavy font weight. So I'm going to give it 800. If we save that, you can see it's very bold now, but it's still very small. So let's make this big. We'll say font size, let's go with 18 rem. We want to fill the page for the most part, and I think that will do it. After that, let's say text align and set this to center. And now we've centered Jane's name as well. Okay, after that, let's provide a background, and we could just say background once again with this shorthand, or we could say background image. So I'm going to go ahead and say image, we'll provide URL, and now we go up into the image folder, and then let's take that scenic image that we previously had and save. And now of course we see the clouds, we haven't changed the position or anything else of the image, but we'll do some of that here. Let's at least change the size. So background size is going to be 100%. And now we can see that full image behind Jane's name. So now let's go ahead and text-transform, set Jane's name to uppercase, and it's really filling out the page now. Now the property I wanna talk about is background clip. So let's look this up at caniuse.com because there's something specific about it, background-clip. We'll select that and you see background dash clip text and it says a non-standard method of clipping a background image to the foreground text. So it says unprefixed is only supported by about 19% of browsers, but there is a prefix that we need to use with this. So we can see the support for Edge, not Explorer, and we're not really going to worry about Explorer ever, probably. But for Chrome, you see the little yellow here, and it says supported with prefix WebKit. Firefox doesn't need that, but just about everybody else does. So we need to use that prefix when we apply this property. So what we're going to do is say dash webkit dash background dash clip and now we'll say text now this won't do everything that we want but it did take the background away here in chrome as expected let's set the color and we want this to be transparent so at first i'm just going to choose this black color and now we'll do the work here by clicking on the color getting that pop up i'm going to switch this over to hsl We'll pull this down to about 20% right in there and take a look at what we get now. So now 
it's a little dark because we can still see 20% of the black, but essentially we're seeing the image inside the text only, which is kind of a cool way to do that. We'll go ahead and put this to zero and see if it makes much of a difference. And yeah, it might have lightened up just a little bit. So you could make this a little darker by adding about 20%, and there you can see the difference. And you could do this with other colors too. We're essentially creating that same mask over the image, or you could make it totally transparent. And I believe to do that, you could just say transparent and save, and yep, that works too. So if you want it totally transparent, you don't even have to put a color there at all. Now, this will not be working in Firefox. You would need to, of course, use that as a fallback for when it is not supported in browsers, and otherwise, you need to have this. Will this impact Chrome by putting it there? No, but now this would also make it work in Firefox. And now every other browser that needs this WebKit prefix also works, so we just have to have both there. And before we wrap up, I am realizing we didn't really cover that background shorthand, which can be very confusing, and I like to use the individual ones like background color and background image when possible, but let's come back up to what I commented out on the body and uncomment that so we'll see Jane's name over the bubbles, and we can save that much. But now what we essentially want to provide here when I do use the background shorthand is just a few of these properties, three specifically. So we'll start with the repeat. We'll say repeat dash Y, and then we'll say right center for the position, and then we'll have our URL, which was dot dot slash image slash, and then we had our bubbles selected, and then we can put a comma, and we can supply the values for that second image as well. So now we'll say no dash repeat, and then we'll have our linear dash gradient, if I could spell once again, and then we'll say two left, and we had steel blue, and then we had, I believe, just our regular white, yep, there we go and then we can go ahead and put the semicolon there. Now let's put size after that because we didn't attempt to include the size in the background shorthand. However you can, it's just fairly complex and it gets confusing, so you could look that up on MDN if you want to. I'll provide a link in the resources. But this is about as complex as I like to get with that shorthand or it just starts to get to get too confusing. So what we've done is eliminate the background image, background repeat, and background position properties that were individually there. So I'll just comment those out. If we save, we have the same result using the background shorthand. Remember to keep striving for progress over perfection, and a little progress every day will go a very long way. Please give this video a like if it's helped you, and thank you for watching and subscribing. You're helping my channel grow. Have a great day, and let's write more code together very soon.